and just wait for a few more people to filter in and then we can kick off. Okay, well, just bearing in mind the time constraints for this webinar, let's kick things off. And good afternoon to everyone who's dialed in from Asia Pacific. For those in Europe, good morning. And for those in the United States, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Benjamin Quinlan. I am the CEO and managing partner of Quinlan and Associates and the chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Very excited today to be able to present a what I would call a star-studded panel to talk about a very interesting topic that we feel hasn't probably received enough attention in this space in Asia Pacific. And it's fundamentally looking at the outlook for SPACs in the region. Um, for the purposes of the panel today, just to give you uh, a, some context on how this session will be run, we are going to be joined by uh, Christina, Paul, Selena, and Virginia, and Sungjun. The webinar format, we will be running this for 75 minutes. I will start the presentation with a 15 minute introductory overview, just to set the scene for those of you who may not be as familiar with the world of SPACs. We then move to the panel for 50 minutes and we'll open up the last 10, maybe 15 minutes for Q&A. On that note, let me do uh, the handover for the introduction. So maybe we can start with each of our panelists. Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Um, uh, ben, very nice uh, backdrop. I can see uh, you are carrying on the Winter Olympics uh, spirit. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Christina Bao. I'm uh, from the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. I'm very happy to be here uh, to participate in this panel to talk about uh, a very hot topic in Asia, uh, SPAC. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, the uh, co-head of uh, sales and marketing uh, for uh, HAES at uh, we're responsible for issuer marketing as well as uh, for secondary uh, uh, marketing with our key participants and uh, uh, you know and investors in this market. We're, we're you know very uh, happy to be here to talk with the uh, the panelists uh, uh, today to share some of our thoughts and uh, you know wishes uh, for the uh, uh, you know very healthy de development of the spec uh, in the uh, Asian region. Back Wonderful. to you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Christina. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, indeed, uh, exciting uh, and, and timely topic to talk about. So um, I'm uh, responsible for sales and origination within SGX. That includes the uh, capital markets part of the business, so where we attract issuers to the exchange. I, I joined SGX in July last year after 20 years with, with Goldman in the bank, on the banking side, um, mostly in Europe, uh, a little bit in the US a long time ago, and the last five, six years out here in Asia, uh, based in Hong Kong. Uh, before I moved down to Singapore to, to join SGX. Uh, so with that, I think I've got a, a, a reasonably broad perspective of SPACs and, and capital markets more generally uh, across various jurisdictions. So uh, looking forward to this discussion. It's, it's really an exciting time to have come to Singapore and to SGX, uh, given really the opportunities that we see ahead in, in capital markets across the region. And we're already seeing a lot of uh, movement and momentum. Uh, the development of our SPAC regime is, is an important part of that. Uh, it's led to uh, listing on SGX of the first three SPACs earlier this year, uh, last month. Uh, and that's been a, a, a good success. So thanks, Ben, for your focus and insights on this. And uh, you know, great being part of the discussion. Cheers, Paul. Pleasure to have you. Uh, Selena, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me. Um, very excited about this topic. Um, so my name is Selena, and I co-run the ECM business for UBS out of Asia. Um, and uh, we have participated in some of the earliest specs that have happened in the region, including the New Frontier one. Uh, and then we've since then had a number of uh, specs that we've helped uh, in the US and have also put through a spec uh, onto the SGX. Uh, and then we have some on file with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange as well. So very happy to come and share today our um, experience and thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Selena. Over to you, Virginia. Yeah, thank you, Ben, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, my name is Virginia Lee. I'm a partner uh, of the corporate group of the Clifford Chance Hong Kong office, uh, and I specialize in, obviously, IPOs uh, and other capital markets work and M&A for listed companies. Um, 
very exciting topic, uh, and we we do work very closely for this particular product uh, with our um, Singapore colleagues and colleagues in the US. So happy to share our experience um, in this area. Wonderful, pleasure to have you, Virginia. And last but not least, Songjun. Thanks, Ben. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be uh, at the uh, webinar today. Uh, my name is Astrid Huang. Uh, I've been with Credit Suisse for over 25 years in Hong Kong, uh, uh, involved in the institutional and all the private wealth management businesses. Uh, in 2019, founded uh, Atlas Investor Management, and now I'm the CEO of Atlas Growth Acquisition. Great to be on the uh, panel today. Wonderful. So thanks, Sunjun. So as you can all see, we've got the heavy hitters here to talk about it, SGX, HKX, the leading investment bank in the region, one of the leading law firms, as well as a sponsor of themselves. So a big variety of perspectives, which should hopefully give all the participants today good color on exactly where this industry is moving going forward. Now, for those of you who didn't catch it, we did produce some insights on this particular topic in a report uh, that was released a few months back. And this report was called Spectacular, nice cheeky title. What we're gonna do is give you a little bit of color around some of the key insights to set the scene, as I said, and to really just get you up to speed on what SPACs are and what's currently happening in the industry. It's really for the experts here to then provide their insights and overlay their perspectives on where this is all gonna go going forward. So let's just kick things off with traditional listing routes. So if you are a company and you're looking to raise capital and go public, you can either do that via an initial public offering, create new shares, that's underwritten by an intermediary such as an investment bank. And there is a value chain and process that you go through from selecting your underwriter to structuring and the management of that deal. Alternatively, if you're not doing an IPO, you can do a DPO, a direct listing, and that does not require underwriters because there's no new shares being created, and it simply allows existing shareholders to exit without needing to raise new capital. So looking along that value chain, you can see some components of that are not relevant anymore. Key benefits, really no cost of underwriting, no dilution, and no lockup period. However, it's it's not always so straightforward. So if you're looking at people that ultimately want to IPO, uh, it's very timely. It could take about 10 to 12 months to do that. Um, it's also very costly. There's a lot of third-party engagements involved. Direct, indirect costs can really skyrocket. If you're looking even on the DPO side, then you've got issues around things like a lack of external support, given that you don't have an underwriter anymore and other third-party services there. There's less promotion around that event volatility because the issuer is unable to influence price setting and there is no capital raise, right? So basically it's releasing existing stock to allow current investors to exit from a company. The third party engagements are also very extensive, just drilling down on that point. So you wanna go list in a market, you need your capital markets advisor, your legal counsel, your iBank, independent auditors, the list goes on. The, the only point I really wanna make on here is time and money is really a thing. So that brings into question, how is that influencing the number of publicly traded companies out there? If we look at the growth in the number of companies worldwide in existence, and we actually compare that against the number of companies listing, you can see that listings have increased from the GFC 2009 until the end of 2020 by about 18%. But the number of companies globally has increased by about 40%. There's been a narrative saying more companies are choosing to stay private for longer because there's so much private liquidity around. Some of this data is suggesting that might actually be very true. And on their current trajectory, 10,000 companies short for of where it should be is what we estimate the current shortfall to be. So there is a gap there. There is something that can be plugged. So we enter the world of SPAC. Now, for those of you who don't know what a SPAC is, it really can be just simply broken down into three simple steps. First is list, second is source, and third is DSPAC. So you basically, as a SPAC manager, you take an unlisted SPAC, you get approval to list it on a securities exchange as a blank shell company. That company then has a window of time to either merge or acquire another company, at which point that entity is DSPAC. It's really as simple as that. There's not too much more to explain. There are some nuances that you can do research and read up on our report in your own time, but that is the core mechanism of how a SPAC works. 
And if you look at why SPAC, at least in theory, and if you compare it to an IPO and DPO process, there are potential benefits and or shortfalls, but the reality of how it should be, I guess, marketed is it's an alternative route to going public and it combines the best of both worlds, the best of its traditional IPO in the sense that you can raise capital, there's promotion, there is external support, but also from the DPO side of the process as well. It's faster and more efficient time to market. So again, that, that has been a lot of the rationale for why SPACs came about in recent years. Stakeholder benefits, higher from an issuer side, higher assurance, the su support of a sponsor, from an investor side, you can get institutional investors in there because there's money back guarantees. Retail investors also benefit from new investment opportunities. And from a sponsor perspective, both downside protection and upside potential, just given the structure of how these SPAC deals are usually done. Market adoption, we've seen this all kick off in the United States back in 1993 as the first adopter. So it's not a new concept. It just really, you know, developed a lot of hype in the past few years. Um, other entry into Europe, you can see in Asia and so on. And really at the end of last year was when Singapore and Hong Kong came onto the scene, launching their local SPAC regimes. And that is why we have HKX and SGX on the call today. So it's very exciting with two of the key financial hubs in the region now supporting local SPAC listings. Very quick analysis. So how do these regimes differ? You can see a couple of key metrics here around minimum capital raise, how IPO proceeds should be held in the trust, so what needs to be done, DSPAC time limits. So for example, Hong Kong, 24 months to announce, and then 36 months to complete. That would you know, contrast with the United States where it's 24 months to complete at both the NYSE and NASDAQ. You can get extension time. So you can see variability here, Hong Kong six months, Singapore 12, and the United States one year, and then public shareholding requirements. So just a very quick snapshot of the key differences between these regimes. So what's the case for Asia? I think overall, we've seen a big, uh, robust adoption drive in North America and Europe. Asia seems to be the natural next step for the SPAC community to focus on. And if you look at where the ultimate interest in terms of popular issuer countries of origins are, China, India really stand out at the top of the list as potential issuer countries. And of course, you've got a few regions in there like Singapore, Japan as well, also making that list. Why is Asia going to work? The bottom line is we still have a very robust regulatory environment, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore, huge pools of capital and very deep liquidity, vast pool of targets. We've all known that, especially in the digital age, a lot of new fintechs, health tech companies that have spawned over recent years and the rise of these companies has been astronomical. Um, they are representing very attractive targets to many of these SPAC managers and also suitable, suitable sponsors, Asia-based high net worth individuals, family offices, PE firms, very well positioned to take advantage of this sponsorship role in the region. Market size, so 133 billion of proceeds in 2021 year to date when we last got this number. So that was accurate as at the end of September of last year. 24% uh, of all IPO deals and 31% of all IPO proceeds in 2021 at that point were estimated to be based on the SPAC model. It is not a trivial uh, access to capital or mechanism to bring companies to, uh, to list. And if you look at the market size in APAC, we've also seen considerable growth, albeit from a much lower base. Uh, 2016, about 200, or what is that? That's uh, $200 million in terms of proceeds raised, deal values. At the end of last year, it totaled about $5 billion for the year. Our view is you're probably going to see a 6, 7x increase in this issuance activity over the next four to five years. And we think that is not unrealistic. So, of course, there are challenges. Um, a couple of things going on in the SPAC market right now, high underwriting fees, target sourcing difficulties. So there are time limits, as you've seen. There could be supply demand mismatches given competition, due diligence shortcomings. There are cases of this happening and potential lack of expertise from a geographic and sectoral perspective. 
The final thing is, you know, what's caught media attention is lackluster post despacking returns. So it's a it's an obvious cause of concern, and it's something that you know we'll share a little bit more color on in a few minutes. So the underwriting fees, of course, banks, the law firms, the advisors see there is a lot of potential here because there's a huge amount of activity. Um, banks and underwriters typically take uh, fees in the form of 2% initial fee and then 3.5% the on success. I know speaking to different banks, those fee uh, amounts can vary, and that's as a proportion of the proceeds raised. So is, as of 2021, we're closing in on about $3 billion of fees uh, for the investment banking uh, industry. And if you look at how that's broken down, significant sums of money, Credit Suisse at about 16.2% of the market, 7, 10 million, it gives you a snapshot. There is a lot of activity in this space and obviously a lot of third parties uh, that are looking to get involved and drive this forward. And of course we have UBS who is uh, joining us today uh, and their Asia Pacific team, obviously leading the charge in this space. Target sourcing difficulties. Let me put this in perspective. So recent study conducted by Bloomberg found that 76% of SPACs presently have no M&A deals in place. So of all the SPACs in the market, 121 pending, 23 rumored, 445, nothing in the pipe. So more than three quarters of SPACs are still actively hunting for targets. So an important note and data point. Post these backing returns, even if we look at that, what's happened in terms of negative gross returns over three, six, and 12 months periods after they despack. Um, these returns have not only underperformed the IPO index, but also things like the Russell 2000 index. And you can see here, it's been a little bit lackluster, and it's obviously pointing to potential problems with the kind of companies that are listing and or valuation issues associated what, with what is being taken to market. Quickly on some case studies. So again, we've seen some infamous cases in the SPAC world, such as Akazu, the Electrum Group, and Nicola of failed SPACs, things that fundamentally went wrong. And when you look across the bars at the bottom, the ticks and dashes, you can see what were their problems, were there issues around time limits, supply demand mismatch, due diligence shortcomings in particular, and a dearth of expertise. So in the case of Akazu, which is probably one of the most famous ones, the sponsor ex extended their business combination timeline, that tie up multiple times, and then failed with their due diligence duties. Uh, and Akazu was found to be misrepresenting its performance and reached a $38 million settlement with the US SEC. A little bit more of a breakdown about this, Akazu or Modern Media uh, raised over 200 million, right, in an IPO and uh, target sourced Akazu underwent a journey and that was marred by a number of shortfalls. And those shortfalls happen across target identification, the combination deadline, the proceed reimbursement, um, the Akazu despacking, as well as the due diligence failures being exposed. So again, bringing into question things around governance and risk associated with these models. So what's it gonna take to make all of this work? So let me just finish up on this. How do sponsors really triumph in this space? Our view is there's a couple of key ingredients to really bring home a successful SPAC model. We generally think that SPACs need to be operator-led, led by people with rich experience, with good network centrality that can really drive that DSPAC outcome. Negotiation strategies are very important in an environment where lofty valuations persist and also looking beyond your immediate borders to other geographies and or sectors outside of maybe your comfort zone. Robust governance is a non-negotiable and that versatile expertise bringing in a team with credible backgrounds and experience to really help you scan wider, look longer term, and ultimately think of the long-term success of this newly de entity. Operator-led SPACs, this is basically people that have experience, like a former C-suite executives, really at the helm. It's different to ones that are investor-led, right? And it's different to ones that are celebrity-led. I think we've all seen a couple of celebrity-led SPACs out there that obviously garner a lot of media attention, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily put my money behind some of these celebrities in terms of their business acumen to get these deals done. And then when you look at the outperformance, it's actually telling seven day, 30 day, 90 day, 180 and 365 day returns 
for operator-led SPACs and non-operator-led SPACs. It's pretty evident that the DNA and makeup of the people in charge of driving the SPAC is a fundamental determinant to the overall long-term success of that particular listing. Network centrality, we're also seeing is very important, some data on this. So on the left-hand side, you can see fundraising. So IPO deal size for those uh, SPACs with high network centrality, we're larger on, on average by about 1.5X, pipe deal size about six and a half X larger. And then in terms of the time taken to actually uh, complete uh, much faster as well. Well, not much, but at least notably faster for those with high network centrality. Geographic expansion as well. The number of non-US de-spacking activities is also on the rise. Uh, it's actually risen by about 17 times year on year since the start of 2020 uh, up until Q2 2021. So a lot of American SPACs are actually venturing abroad to target some of these new companies, which obviously bodes well for regions like Asia Pacific. Sponsor governance, again, a very important uh, perspective here. Putting together the right group of individuals that can lend brand power, that can scout targets, evaluate a pipeline, so really deliver on due diligence. The gumption to win this SPAC off race, 75% of the companies out there are still looking for their targets. And then the expertise to actually support with continued growth of that DSPAC entity. Negotiation, also very true. Um, it's fiercely competitive out there, as I'm sure our sponsor here can talk today about, but there is a limited pool of targets. So SPAC offs are taking place. So it makes very effective negotiation with target companies and it's essential ingredients to get this right. The deal certainty, the valuation, sponsor equity, all of these ingredients are critical in ensuring that this ultimately ends up being a fruitful DSPAC in the end. And then of course, finally outsourcing strategy, right? The reality is sponsors are not superheroes. They have their limitations. So working with and partnering with the right providers, the banks, the law firms, anyone in this space who ultimately has the right kind of capabilities, the consulting firms, whatever it might be to help with the journey, be it executive search, expert network, DD services, corporate governance. If you can bring that right ecosystem together, then obviously the chances of getting this back deal right are significantly higher. So that is the introduction. Now I know for those of you uh, who haven't familiarized yourselves with SPACs, that might be a lot to take in, but don't worry, you can download the report after, but you're not here to listen to me. Hopefully that set the scene for this conversation. And now our panelists can really hammer home what matters from their perspectives, given the roles that they sit in. So on that note, let's move over to the panel discussion and talk a little bit more um, and I think the logical place to start is really with the Hong Kong and Singapore local SPAC listing regimes. You've recently announced, Christina and Paul, um, your support for domestic SPAC listings. You've put your listing regimes in, in place. What was the underlying motivation um, for supporting domestic SPAC listings for you as an entity? And maybe I'll give the courtesy to Paul because SGX was first cab off the rank. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Not, not that it was ever a, a race, of course. No. <laughs> um, listen, I think we need to see this from our perspective, at least in a, in a broader context, right? So where the capital markets uh, is headed uh, in, in this part of the region and the opportunities that we see from that perspective. A lot of that is macro driven. So uh, Asia growth outpacing the world for the you know, next couple of years, probably even decades. Uh, and that is attracting more and more capital from the West to East. And that's a swing that we are uh, experiencing as we speak. Uh, that's been building up over time. Every single uh, relevant investor is currently firmly present in, in Asia, both across Hong Kong and Singapore. This is both on the private and on the public side uh, and, and very focused on the region. Um, why? Um, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of companies finally emerge um, that are approaching IPO readiness. Um, so Southeast Asia is starting to turn that corner uh, real fast. And, and that is something that we hadn't seen in sort of three, four, five years ago, or even further, further back. Um, 
if, if there is currently, let's say 70, 80 unicorns across Southeast Asia, um, that's increasing by you know, up to five every month, if we believe what we see in terms of announcements across the, across the papers, uh, this will double very fast over the next year or so. Um, and, and so plenty of supply coming to uh, our, our platform. Um, that leaves me extremely bullish for the capital markets prospects. And you know, whether that's through IPOs, conventional IPOs or through specs, uh, it, I think it's, it's both of it because you know, with the right structure and you, know, you, you pointed out rightfully a, a number of challenges in the spec space that we've experienced, but with the right structure and alignment of incentives in place, um, you know, it's our firm belief that there will be a permanent place for specs in the equity capital market spectrum. Um, you know, where, where there is real value add for, from sponsors to certain types of issuers, not all issuers, but certain types of issuers. Uh, so we started our consultation uh, about a year ago. In fact, we did a consultation 10 years ago and we felt that the market wasn't right for it then. And that was probably true. Um, we picked it up last year. Uh, we've had tremendous amounts of engagements from across the spectrum. So it's sponsors, it's investors, it's also DSPEC company. So that's really strengthens uh, us in our belief that there is indeed a place for specs in, in this time zone. And that's really why we've, why we've launched the framework. Wonderful. Thanks, Paul. How about you, Christina? Hong Kong is obviously one of the world's leading IPO centers. What was the rationale to open up the spec regime here? Yeah, Ben, just to, uh, to put it in a very simple word, uh, it's uh, really the word comes from demand. Uh, actually, in the past few years, uh, we have been talking with a number of uh, issuers and a number of uh, uh, investors who have uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, shared with us their experience uh, or you know, observations of uh, the U.S. aspects in particular. So what they have observed is that, you know, of course, there, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, incentives that are driving the market, such as the uh, uh, supply of liquidity uh, during the COVID, uh, in particular in the U.S. market, but there's also very true that some uh, companies are hoping that they could partner with very sophisticated investors to, uh, uh, to go into the public market. And those investors uh, might be in a very good position to give them better pricing or better valuation or more reasonable valuation to, to, some, uh, to certain extent. So if these companies, uh, you know, assume that a lot of these companies are being targeted as, uh, as uh, you know, as, uh, you know uh, M&A assets for, uh, for these aspects already, launched it in the US. And then eventually these Asian companies will go to the US for uh, their uh, you know, IPO, uh, you know, uh, and, and they're, you know, basically the ultimate destination will be being in the US market rather than the Asian market. So they, it's you know, basically and very fundamentally demand driven and clients driven. Uh, on the other hand, we believe that uh, you know, um, after, uh, again, also very uh, wide and very uh, deep uh, sort of uh, engagements with the market participants, uh, we believe that we can actually develop a structure that would actually uh, work in a way that uh, would uh, be able to provide a uh, uh, you know supplement to the traditional IPO uh, uh, route, where in the same time you know uh, in a uh, design in a way that we can also protect the investors properly, so that uh, you know a lot of uh, the investors who have very little knowledge about this particular structure uh, may not be exposed to too much risks during that process. Because think about SPAC, it is really a, a longer journey than an IPO. Because in a traditional IPO, you just do it in a 12 months and then you are a public traded, market, uh, traded company. And then the investor go in knowing exactly what they're going to invest in, right? But in a SPAC, uh, at the very beginning doing a SPAC IPO, you have no idea who you're going to invest in, right, eventually. What you're really doing is to select the partner you want to, you know, kind of work together for, next, for the next two years until that partner finds the right target. So that's a, that's a huge uh, investment, so, you know, without knowing, you know, what you're betting on, right? So even, you know, Ben, like yourself, like a very professional investor, you may have to think through, like, you know, what kind of specs they may want to participate in. And, you know, just to think about other investors, we, we definitely need to provide the, uh, the, uh, the right level of uh, safeguards. Uh, and uh, make sure that they are, you know, there's a balance between the commercial interest as well uh, uh, with the uh, investors' uh, protection. And luckily, with all these uh, feedback on the market, we were able to uh, launch a SPAC regime in Hong Kong uh, January the 1st, you know, 2022, you know, so 
uh, in the first month of uh, our two months of, in the first two months of our operation, uh, we're hugely uh, you know encouraged by already seven applications into uh, into the uh, uh, pipeline, and uh, we're seeing you know a, a you know a, a still a, a very robust pipeline coming in our way. So I think you know that's uh, also you know the market actually uh, speaks for itself by you know uh, showing their interest uh, regardless of. Uh, uh, you know that we are a little bit late into this market, but I think you know we we should be the right place for many of uh, the spec promoters. Given a lot of their target assets, probably want to be, uh, you know, targeting a listing in Hong Kong uh, and, and enjoy the liquidity and the valuation and the richness of the investor base. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I like the way you sum it up: demand and uh, and I think you know if there is interest, then you follow where the market goes. And I take Paul's point around you know 10 years ago the market just wasn't there it wasn't the right time so uh just on that point though and i want to stay with paul and, and christina for this because the local listing regimes that you've rolled out there may be some differences as i highlighted earlier in my presentation with what's going on in nasdaq nyc and other regimes around the world in your own words what what are the key differences and what was the rationale behind those differences when you were actually putting the the framework for your local listing regimes in place um, and maybe back to you paul on this yeah so i mean there's technical aspects of of that in terms of what is exactly in the framework and you know what the application should look like uh but but i actually think you know whilst capital markets are pretty globalized I, I i do believe in distinct value proposition of a particular listing venue and so if i think about our biggest differentiator versus the us venues europe hong kong it is um our unique positioning in what's unfolding here in in this part of the in this part of the world um i think about that as Singapore's right to win, just as the US has their right to win and Hong Kong will have their right to win, right? So a, uh, a US spec sponsor um, who is looking for de-spec targets in the Midwest, um, we will not be the obvious venue for them, but we are the obvious venue for connecting global and uh, regional or, or local um, sponsors and investors with investment propositions, um, issuers, despect targets that have meaningful presence or a nexus in this part of the world. So that's, I think, really the, the biggest differentiator between all of this. As it comes to the technical aspects, um, you know, we've, we've sought to be globally competitive, right? We need to have a competitive offering uh, with our framework. Um, and I think we've succeeded in that also as Christ Christina said, taking into account the, the feedback from the market. Um, where we ended up, I think, mirrors the US quite closely in most um, aspects. At the same time, we've also learned from, um, you know, I guess some of the exuberance and overheating that we saw in the market there and, and, and try to address that through some salient points. Um, and these are maybe small points, but they're still important for us. So one is, uh, the quality of the sponsor and the weight that that has in the vetting and application process. And so this comes down to reputation, the track record of the sponsor, uh, their vested interest, uh, and do they really have a, a, a unique angle? Mm -hmm. um, second is, um, you know, the alignment of interest between the sponsors and the investors. Uh, so with that, we've implemented a number of um, thresholds for minimum equity participation. We in, included a moratorium of six to 12 months to hold the shares of the sponsor post a spec transaction. Uh, important. Frankly, I think that's where the market is headed in any case, because we just see more market discipline come into this space. And, and we've just formalized that because we believe it's important. Yep. Um, another fundamental point for us that was important is to make sure that there's no fundamental arbitrage between achieving a listing through a spec or a conven conventional IPO process. Um, what that means in practice is that a, a DSPEC target needs to meet our basic listing requirements and uh, the admission standards. Now, you know, that's relatively straightforward and certainly a lot of these companies that we see emerge, it would not be any, any big issue for them. Um, the, the, the one last thing, and that's certainly a um, meaningful difference, certainly relative to 
uh, the, the Hong Kong framework is uh, participation of retail. Uh, for, for us, we found it important that retail can participate. And we've also experienced in the first couple of deals that we've seen that there is indeed uh, a real uh, uh, interest from the retail segment for, for this product. Right, thanks Paul. I know Hong Kong Exchange, the, the listing rules are slightly different from Singapore, so keen to hear the perspectives on the, the rationale why. Yeah, uh, I guess when, when we uh, sort of researched on this topic, uh, there, there are a couple of things that really matter a great deal to us. Uh, one is that we, we really want to be along in this game, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, we, it's not like a short term uh, or quick way that, that we want to uh, sort of achieve, uh, you know, by launching this uh, uh, SPAC regime in Hong Kong. So ideally, we would like to, you know, because, you know, we, we're focusing on the long, uh, long term uh, uh, weighing or uh, you know, benefits, we focus a lot on the quality uh, of the, the SPAC issuance, right? So, so the uh, entire sort of philosophy is, uh, is around like, you know, do you want to actually attract, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of SPACs with a lot of cash just sitting idle, uh, not able to find targets, or do you want to, you know, find some, uh, you know, really high quality deals over time and to sort of build a strong reputation in this market that will attract very high quality promoters or very high quality, you know, issuers into this market. So these are the basic and fundamental considerations that we have in our mind when we were uh, sort of developing this uh, this whole thing. Of course, you know, um, a lot of the work was uh, done by our listing colleagues as well as uh, the SFC, uh, you know, uh, colleagues from from their perspective, uh, you know, with all these uh, safeguards development. Uh, I want to share maybe uh, just a, a few highlight a few key things that Hong Kong's back regime may be a little bit different uh, from others when. Is for sure, as I said, the key person uh, in, in this uh, whole spec apparently is the, uh, the sponsor or the promoter. So apparently we would like to uh, make sure that uh, the sponsor's uh, qualifications, experience uh, and relevance uh, are, are quite you know, important in uh, uh, sort of a so-called vetting the uh, uh, spec IPOs. So for sure, you, know, you could look at you know, all these uh, requirements in terms of uh, what kind of license they should hold and the experience and the asset size of uh, under the management, et cetera. And the other thing about that is, uh, you know, uh, we want to make sure that there's uh, also a trade-off uh, or, you know, proper balance between the uh, promoter's interest and the public interest. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the maximum, uh, uh, so the, the shares or the, uh, the warrants that uh, promoter uh, or sponsor can hold, there's a, there's a maximum um, requirements. So a lot of the things is really drawing the, the lessons learned from other markets because uh, you could sort of don't, you know, uh, choose not to do anything now, but just wait for the things to, to sort of happen uh, later in the stage and try to you know, fix those issues. But what we have basically decided is to make sure that uh, at the front end, a lot of these things are being taken care of. So yeah. sponsor, um, you know, quality apparently is uh, the key. Uh, and, uh, you know, similar to that is uh, the pipe investment. Uh, apparently, you know, apparently there is no uh, retail in our stack regime. So uh, another major sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, validation will be coming from the uh, pipe investors. Uh, as long as the pipe investors also are comfortable with the, uh, the deal, with the uh, uh, pricing, uh, you know, with all the terms and conditions, I think once the, um, you know, these back to target actually went in, uh, goes into the market, the public market, uh, the public market will feel more comfortable that the the, uh, uh, the you know the IPO is a, is a you know reasonably good one, right? Yeah. Uh, and the third point I want to talk about is the uh, uh, similar to what Paul just uh, mentioned is that we basically hold the same criteria uh, for this bad target to become an uh, you know a public company, so that there is no arbitrage between a normal or traditional IPO uh, versus uh, the uh, this bad uh, uh, route. So that's uh, I think is very important because uh, again you know it, you know just the in principle uh, whoever you, whatever sort of a means you use to, to go into the market basically the, the investor should be able to look at the uh, uh, the assets with the uh, you know comparable quality um, and criteria and the last point on, on retail I just want to mention that uh, you know of course uh, it you know retail would be interested we would assume. Uh, but still, given the com uh, complex structure, given the extended uh, timeline, and given a lot of the uncertainties, and given you know it's a very early stage, an amazing stage for the development, 
uh, again, you know, the retail is not uh, included in the in the current regime, but uh, but they will be able to participate once uh, the dispatch is uh, completed and the asset will be uh, you know publicly traded. Right. Very in depth. Thanks for your perspectives. But despite the differences, obviously the common theme coming out is quality over quantity, and then obviously ensuring that the right sponsors and deals come to market and. You know, you, I know you mentioned, Christina, a, a little late to market, but I think learning from the experiences of everything that's happened offshore to really leverage that for a best practice regime in Hong Kong and Singapore is a very important takeaway. It's something that, you know, actually puts you in very good stead. So hopefully we will be seeing these high quality deals coming to market. And it's something that we as a firm ultimately agree with as well. All right. So thanks very much to both the exchanges for the contextual introduction. Now let's go into some of the, the, the juicy parts right, that I'm sure that the sponsors, the investment banks and the lawyers would be all over. So we've obviously seen this huge growth in the number of sponsors worldwide, SPAC offs taking place, profit valuations, people looking for targets. Um, as these SPAC offs start to happen and as the targets become harder to source, what is basically the things that sponsors need to do to best prepare themselves or set themselves up to succeed, to ultimately get this right. So maybe I'll start with Sung Jun as a sponsor, and then we can bring it over to perhaps Selena afterwards. Sung Jun. Hi, thanks. Now, it's certainly become uh, more challenging, uh, I guess, to find targets, uh, but it's akin to, I guess, like a football team trying to bring uh, different skill sets and kind of working hard together. Uh, I think a team uh, that brings a full suite of skills, uh, public and private investing, m and experience, operational knowledge, domain expertise, but also very critically SPAC expertise, I think will be very, very beneficial. But also I think critically, I think even more so today is the ability to demonstrate an ability to bring strategic value to the target. And what I mean by this one would be to deliver a solid pipe funding uh, strategic institutions people really need to think outside the box uh, it's becoming very challenging to find money from the traditional institutions out there uh, but also it's even more important with the very high redemption rates we're seeing today uh, lastly i'll just say that it's also the ability to bring strategic relationships to grow the business. I could be uh, to a US company that's looking to expand into Asia. So if you can bring that special unique angle, certainly you look a lot more attractive and viable. Very, very relevant and spot on points. I mean, Selena is like the person in the driver's seat working alongside a lot of these sponsors. What's the recipe to success for you? How do they set themselves up to get this right? I'll have to echo what SJ said, right? Because I think strategic value will be critically important because uh, in the normal SPAC structure, the sponsor to promote will actually be a little bit of a dilute development. And so from a target perspective, you're looking at whether money is equal. Do I want money from a normal financial investor who may not be able to give me that strategic access and network versus a sponsor who can actually help me build, my, build and grow my business? So I think that is actually essentially how targets think about it on top of the fact that they could potentially provide uh, additional funding to support the growth of the business. So I think um, from a target's perspective, they'll be balancing against the size of the SPAC versus the valuation of my asset together of what other value um, this particular SPAC sponsor could provide to me. And if I'm thinking about it in the right way, then I will balance um, versus in say in Singapore and Hong Kong, how long that's going to take me for a normal public market process. Do I want to take the market risks and see what the market will give me in return for the value? Or I have a strategic investor or SPAC sponsor right there who's offering me hot dollar check. This is the amount that I'm going to be putting my asset out for public. Um, and do I, am I comfortable with this valuation? Am I getting support and strategic support? I think those are the things that are actually going through a target's mind. And so to craft your spec um, well, these are the things that you want to prep your sponsors to think way ahead of even starting the process. So you ensure that they are successful in their path. Yeah, thinking ahead, looking much more down the path of strategic rather than just the, the dollar value is money available right now. How about you, Virginia? Anything to add from a legal perspective? Yeah, I, I think um, what, 
has been mentioned, one point I really resonate is the um, the piped um, um, funds because under the Hong Kong regime, there is uh, a minimum uh, particip participation of the pipe investors, right? Depending on the size of the valuation of the target. So I think um, here, this is quite, I think challenging in a sense because you do need to have the solid uh, piped um, funds, but also from pipe investors that are of you know reputable of a minimum size to validate um, devaluation. So I think from a lawyer standpoint, I'm very encouraging to hear what have just been mentioned by Selena and SJ here. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, actually, I'm going to pop back to you, Selena. Um, you know, I, I think this is an interesting question, just given you have an overview perspective as a banker, right? So what type of company is it? Is it fintech, healthcare, uh, renewable energy, edtech? What, what are the things, what are the kind of targets that are being identified as the most lucrative and willing uh, for SPACs? And are there any common characteristics uh, that you can identify between these kinds of targets? High growth. I think high growth would be my first thing that I would uh, address out of it being, of course, being a good company. But I think high growth would be critical because of how the structure is uh, set. Now, there is obviously dilution caps in both the SGX and the Hong Kong and the HKEX structures um, that actually uh, limits that potential dilution. But you know, when we were mentioning about the sponsors promote shares that they will get on top of the additional warrants, you want for the asset to actually be growing at a speed that could compensate for that potential dilution. I think it's an important part to raise because um, that's why you see a lot of these EV, particular verticals, the LiDAR companies doing very well. You see a lot of lithium battery companies doing very well in these specs. You see a lot of platform companies doing uh, very well. I think, you know, minus the current correction in the market and the war today, but I think in reality, I think having really good growth um, and very solid management and strategic value demonstrated by the sponsors will be the critical recipe to get a spec done and done well. Yeah. So whenever I hear growth, I think tech and naturally, right, in this environment. <laughs> but then I'm also thinking, like, what metrics of growth? Customers, top line, bottom line? Like, there's a lot of things that people are starting to consider around this equation. A lot of top line growth doesn't necessarily translate to a good company at the end. Of the I day. used to yeah. think bottom line, and then people tell me I'm too old fashioned. So uh, uh, um, uh. Now, people, <laughs> now people think it's top line, but I think if I'm just joking aside, I think uh, I think with a good trajectory and um, roadmap to top line and bottom line and, a, and really a proven business model already before the injection, I actually think will be, it's just like any other recipe for IPO, right? Yeah. You have to have that. You can't. It can't just be blue sky scenario all the way because that's how the correction happened. Yeah. And um. And and one thing I wanted to highlight in terms of where we are in the market as well, why the U.S. market actually came up so buoyantly about two and a half years ago. It was around the time when the U.S. election happened. Nobody could actually see where the market was going, and it was a very soft period of markets. And at that time, that's when people thought mm, some of the funds would be parking money for downside protected investments and actually wanted to buy into this product. And that became the, the bubble, right? And so now we're sort of closely approaching that time again where people are subject to huge volatility and don't know where to park capital in an increasingly rising interest rate environment. Um, I think this market, again, you know, now that you're, we're all from Asia, you know, very, very keen to see how this market will grow in Asia. Right. Okay. Sungjun, what about sponsor perspective? What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that uh, it's really uh, it's very interesting. I, I think it's kind of also just kind of trying to rejig, kind of go back uh, in history. It's also I think, kind of worth remembering that uh, uh, SPACs are not just a tech story. It was a SPAC that actually reintroduced Burger King to the public equity markets uh, with a whopper of a deal in 2012. Uh, I think, you know, obviously many SPACs have followed thematic trends. Uh, but also, you know, having looked, I kind of did a bit of a count. We've had about 14 electric vehicles, 10 battery makers in the EV space. We've had so-called flying cars or e-VTOLs, I think, which are electrical vehicle takeoff and landing. Uh, again, if you're not the first in a growth subcategory, uh, chances are uh, you'll not be able to so-called shine. Uh, performance becomes a little bit uh, debatable. Uh, but also, I think what we're kind of seeing is that I think SPACs are searching for targets in the valley, I think straddling 
growth and value. Uh, so for example, we've seen like Tim Hortons, China agreed to uh, in August to go public via SPAC. We've also seen the case of Xenia. We've also seen Magnum Opus, uh, the merger announcement with Forbes, which you also recently announced a $200 million investment from Binance. So it's getting a lot more interesting. So there's a more of a mixture of play across growth and value. But I think it really comes down to kind of basics, the 101 is that companies with sustainable business models with a clear path to profitability or revenues will thrive. That I think is the golden rule going forward. Yeah, I think that, that that's an interesting point that resonates a lot with me as soon as you said the word sustainable, right? I mean, we work with a very high growth company. Um, mm -hmm. We just released a report today looking at buy now, pay later businesses. And, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't so kind, right? Um, that we don't see yeah. a part of profitability under current business models. It's as simple as that. So a lot of change required. Um, how about from Virginia and also opening this up to Paul and Christina, anything to add on this? Yeah, I was just like to mention one thing. I think you mentioned sustainable, right? I think I've looked at a lot of these uh, spike perspectives, especially those uh, in Hong Kong. I think obviously companies that have a strong or friendly ESG focus, um, I would think given the emphasis of the regulators uh, in this region, um, in this area, and also investors, um, be it, you know, pipe investor and other, uh, other wider uh, investor group, I think this would be one of the elements that, you know, I think, you know, the market will be very interested in if the issuer or the target, you know, has a very, you know, good ESG um, focus, yeah. Yep, you got to tick those boxes. <laughs> uh, no oil companies then. All right. Uh, Paul or Christina, anything? Well, just sl maybe slightly different perspective uh, because you know what has been said is absolutely true but that also means that they would be perfectly fine traditional uh, conventional IPO candidates um, so where is the value add of going through a spec process versus a conventional and that is in my view mostly for companies that um, are perhaps in slightly more complex industries or operating in complex markets and that's where I see a huge opportunity for us here in Asia because most of the markets in which we operate are more complex uh, and uh, many of the industries as well certainly you know a lot of the, the the companies that we see around us so therefore I believe that there is that space for the spec sponsors for a, a knowledgeable party to make the translation to help the management teams articulate their story to a global investor audience uh, but also help investors understand these stories in a slightly different way. And that, that's, I think, where the value of a, of a spec really comes in. Christina, any final yeah, thoughts? Maybe it, yeah, maybe I can just add a little bit uh, from uh, uh, the seven applicants we have uh, seen so far and uh, the issue, uh, the sponsors that we have been uh, talking to. It seems that uh, the target sectors are quite widely uh, sort of uh, um, uh, you know, spread like uh, uh, SJ just mentioned. You know, there's uh, apparently a lot of them are focusing on tech, and there's biotech, there's commercial tech, uh, consumer tech, and there's also um, apparently uh, smart vehicles or um, you know e commerce, etc. But there are also very traditional sectors such as uh, real estate or uh, you know just the uh, consumer discretion, etc. So I think you know uh, nowadays. Uh, at least the sponsors, when they are searching for targets, they're not trying to limit themselves to a very small sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, space, but they're try really trying to look beyond, uh, you know, a, a wider range of uh, potential targets. But the, the other thing, you know, that's really interesting is that, uh, again, back to Paul's point, uh, if, you know, why would these uh, targets want to choose uh, uh, these back uh, to, you know, as, as the means to go to the, go to the public market, right? So there has to be certain value provided. So one of the key values as we uh, talked through with the, some of the potential issues is that they, uh, the two things, one is a more sort of intrinsic and the other one is a more sort of a, a external uh, factors are driven. The, the intrinsic one is a, a very much like what everybody was just mentioned, like uh, the, what the specific value that a spec promoter may bring to the table, uh, industry expertise or a client network or you know whatever that, that you know the special sort of value they can they can really bring into uh, and the other sort of external factors driven is that um, 
you know, that we are going through a very volatile, uh, um, you know, market situations at this point. So for any um, issuer to come into the market, apparently the uncertainties are on the rise. Uh, and a lot of them are hoping that they could land a deal with a certainty in terms of timeline, in terms of execution, in terms of evaluation. And some of uh, the uh, sponsors or the, the promoters are able to provide that uh, uh, level of certainty to the issuers. Uh, and the issuers for that reason would be, probably would grab this opportunity uh, to come into the market, you know, especially in those sectors that is uh, very capital intensive. Uh, and Ben, uh, just uh, adding to Christina, I think certainly I believe that we'll continue to see targets. So I think as Christina mentioned, and obviously growth sectors, fintech, tech, bio, blockchain, et cetera, but also seeing a broadening out to include more conventional industries, uh, industrials, consumer real estate, and things such as ESG, uh, sustainability, climate, et cetera, et cetera. But also I think, interesting, I think we're gonna be seeing kind of new markets uh, coming on the horizon, uh, not the usual, the US, uh, just, you know, uh, China or greater China or, or Southeast Asian names. We'll see names from Taiwan, you know, from India, but also from the MENA region. So again, I think there's gonna be a huge proliferation of potential targets globally. Yeah. beyond the normal or conventional markets. Absolutely agree. Uh, and that's why I still see a lot of life in this space. <laughs> a pretty, pretty bright future ahead. So we talk about all these opportunities. Just quickly want to touch on risks. Um, we've seen, I presented, there's some fails back deals, things that got, you know, ran afoul, didn't go right. What are the key risks that have to fundamentally be managed to make sure that the process is successful? I won't ask from... Paul and Christina's perspective as regulators, you know what you want, um, but I'm, I'm gonna hand it to a lawyer immediately. Uh, Virginia, you'll, you'll definitely be all over this. I think the risk is really um, how to align the sponsor's interests with obviously the interests of the spec shoulders, but most importantly with the um, spec target interest, right? Because that is the critical point in, in spec because, I mean, I think by part Christina, right? That is the um, advantage as, at least as I lawyer, as I see is that you bring forward the valuation discussion and you have a smaller group discussion to, um, you know, hopefully um, can have more certainty in the valuation, but then um, having a more flexible, um, incentive structure for the spec uh, promoters, then I think that would facilitate that discussion, you know, and you can think of more creative ideas, creative, yep. um, you know, balancing of interests. So I think under the Hong Kong regime, we've seen obviously some flexibility in terms of the initial 20% cap, and then it can increase to 30% um, further, with further in, uh, issuance of shares to the promoters and also um, earn out, um, uh, incentive arrangement. So I think, uh, I would think from lawyers' perspective, I think this is an area that we have to focus on when we structure um, a DSPAC or, well, initially in the SPAC stage and then in the DSPAC uh, stage. Okay, fantastic. So from my, from my favorite professional services providers to my second favorite, uh, investment bank, what do you think, Selena, risk-wise? <laughs> I have to echo with what Virginia said, but I'm going to say it a little bit more directly. I think, um, honestly, I think from a structure perspective, what SPAC provides for that IPOs cannot provide for is structuring. And the structuring of what we can do in terms of the warrants or additional warrants to incentivize IPO investors from not redeeming, that sort of thing, I think that is that would be very interesting. Increasing sponsors uh, promotes or decreasing their promote, uh, assuming you know you get to a fair valuation on agreement. Again, a lot of tailoring and the earnouts that that Virginia mentioned. Um, I think the there are some other risks, but I think the other risks are similar to if you were going to buy in an IPO anyway, in terms of a particular target not being able to reach is a uh, tentative forecast, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that I think every public investor will need to navigate anyway, whether they select a IPO or a SPAC. So I think from a, so if, if you were to ask me to advise a public investor um, from a risk perspective, uh, I do think they are quite well protected on the redemption nature of the product. Mm -hmm. And so that they do have these, um, you know, uh, little tweaks that they can make into the various structures to ensure that they are comfortable with it and they can vote and get out from public market perspective. From a target perspective, they can negotiate 
Um, and so, and they have a definitive valuation in a volatile market, as Christina said. So um, I think it's a it's it's a very good product uh, for the right candidate. Right. How about you, Sungjun, in the sponsor seat, risk wise? What are you looking? Yeah, I think there's plenty of risks out there. <laughs> but really, uh -huh. maybe putting on more of a U.S. lens, uh, I think there are inherent risks, uh, some more structural, um, and that include, obviously, the glut of SPACs. Uh, I think I uh, alluded earlier on, I think there's something like close to 550 to 600 SPACs looking for targets. Uh, I believe close to 40 with an expiry less than six months. So someone's going to be in a bit of a hurry. Uh, obviously, a uh, fundamental issue of price discovery. Uh, valuation is normally in a SPAC arrive through a process of negotiating between a sponsor or target, and a few investors versus a traditional IPO where we have a large number of investors that participate. I guess there's always going to be the pressure to find a target and having sufficient time for proper due diligence. But also very important that's gotten a lot of uh, uh, airtime is the concerns around adequate disclosure, i.e. projections, share dilution, which have been also alluded to on this call. But ultimately, uh, we believe that the market investors will force the attention and help address some of these structural issues. I think through a period of adjustment following the frenzy scene in the first uh, part of, say, 2021, and we're really starting to see that in a number of ways today. Uh, one, we're seeing there's definitely been a significant slowdown in new SPAC IPOs this year. We're seeing targets with more discernible business models, pathways pro to profitability coming to market. Also, it's been telling that it's become very difficult to raise a pipe. I think there've been about six or eight mergers with SPACs canceled in 2022 because of the inability to arrange a pipe. Valuations are being revised downwards as a reflection of the public markets and investor expectations. And last but not least, we're seeing a very poor market reception and performance. So there's a self-regulating mechanism that's going to work itself through the process. But meanwhile, uh, I think we're seeing also uh, much stricter regulatory oversight around disclosure. So I think it's going to take a bit of time, but it, as in any exciting platform uh, uh, product, there will be the euphoria, but a process of adjustment. And I think we're probably the third or fourth inning uh, and seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Okay. Excellent. So I guess uh, the best way to kind of round this up is to get your views as you know the risks, the opportunities, the challenges, everything coming in. Where do we see the APAC SPAC opportunity evolving and the Asian SPAC opportunity evolving in coming years? We've got SGX and HKX now live. How's this all going to pan out? And let's let's hear it from the exchanges. Where do you see this going? We have a pretty bullish view. It's more about quality over quantity. You know, I do see this as a, a very, very credible alternative. Uh, capital raising channel and listing channel. Um, what do you think, Paul? What do you think? No, listen, I, I would I would agree with with all of that. I'm pretty bullish about that as well. Um, as I said earlier, I believe that specs at the right structure will have a permanent place in that spectrum. Um, not not as an you know substitute to IPLs, but but really as another tool in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, that's important because we're seeking to appeal to as broad a spectrum of potential issuers and investors alike as, as possible. Um, and so, you know, there's companies in different life cycles, at a different stage of their life cycle, deciding to go different paths. And we, we want to make sure that we're there to capture that. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, you know, it's still very, very early days, right? So I, I think we're all coming from behind here in Asia, uh, but, but probably for, for good reason, because the market needs to be ready for it. But we're off to a good start. You know, the first three specs on, on, on SGX have had real good reception from global, uh, regional, local, and also the retail investors. Um, we also have a healthy pipeline ahead of us um, with um, you know, sponsors of different types, uh, you know, both regional expertise or global sponsors that have done specs in the past and have knowledge in certain industries that they want to bring uh, to this part of the to this part of the world so uh, we see good pipeline there we're excited about that um, a, a lot of them are doing real work in terms of you know getting their preparations done and beyond that I think we will you know see a regular flow of specs as part of the you know types of companies that will be coming to market um, but you know as, as Selena said 
this being capital markets, we're subject to uh, to the environment. Uh, it's a bit choppy of late, uh, but but we also know that these things tend to be temporary. And and so what we've set ourselves up for here is not for uh, a number of specs in the next quarter. It's really sort of uh, the long term perspective that we all have in mind, and we're 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 excited about that. Great, thanks, Christina. How about you? Where is this all going to go? What's the outlook? Yeah, where well, I think I'm quite positive uh, uh, with the uh, future uh, stat development in Asia. Uh, but what what I want to say is that we don't really set a targets for you know, for example, spec issuance or how many IPOs are done through uh, these back, et cetera, because what we believe really matters to the issuers, to the investors is really the uh, the diversity of uh, assets we're able to provide to this market and that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, sort of uh, convenience and the transparency that we're able to bring uh, to the market uh, and as a market operators, right? So when you, when you guys were talking about risks, I guess, you know, it really depends on, you know, from which perspective or from whose perspective you're looking at those risks. Yeah. So I think it's definitely going to be like a risk benefit uh, balance um, that is going to be uh, uh, gradually uh, evolving. And some of the, the, the lessons have uh, probably have to be learned over time. Yeah. Uh, you know, some, some, cause it is, a, you know, as a, you know, Selena was a pointing out earlier, right? The structure of a SPACs is very special. It does take a lot of, uh, uh, you know, expertise and, and, and insights to, to understand and to appreciate whether that would, uh, uh, you know, be working for you as an issuer or as a, as a you know, pipe investor or, or whoever, you know, that participated in, in, in the whole program. So again, you know, long-term view is very positive, uh, but risk side, I think everybody needs to be uh, aware of the complexity and the, the, the uh, you know, sort of a professional knowledge and expertise that is required. But on the other hand, I think it's a uh, it's great that we have this alternative uh, available uh, to the market, uh, so that people can can you know use all, all kinds of uh, uh, you know uh, financial instruments or financial tours to get to the um, you know their um, ultimate goal. Uh, and I believe, uh, especially during this very volatile market environment, uh, the you know more alternatives there are, the better for the investors and better for the uh, for the issuers, right? So, so I guess, you know, we're just trying to be uh, hoping that we can actually all be, you know, be part of the whole ecosystem uh, build, uh, you know, in the coming years so that uh, the, the agents back will be here to stay and to prosper. Great, thank you. Just bear, bearing in mind time, um, I will bring us over to Selena, Virginia and Song Jun. If you could just give your answers in 30 to 60 seconds so we can go to three very cool questions that have come through. What do you think, Selena, the outlook? Are people lining I'm up? I'm very positive because I think from a re regional perspective, um, from SGX, we talked about the opportunity set and the potential opportunities that, you know, some of the sponsors could be targeting. For Hong Kong, um, in particular, because of the Sino-China-US tensions, it presents a lot of opportunities for those who are targeting China, uh, especially for uh, the sponsors in Hong Kong. So I'll keep it short. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, with all the pressure going on with Chinese firms in the US, is Hong Kong a credible alternative listing venue, right? Um, because that option is now inherent and fraught with a totally different level of risk. How about you, Virginia? Yeah, I think there are many, many credible and quali uh, high quality companies kind of in the pipeline, be it they're already making filings or thinking of filings. I think with the likes of the professionals like, you know, Selena and SJ and ourselves explaining this alternative to them and bringing them this product and, we, once we have one or two been listed, then, you know, those concern about, you know, aftermarket trading, you know, we can see actual examples. I think naturally that will come together like very nicely. Yeah. Wonderful. And then Song Jun, you know, yeah, you're, no, uh, you're off to NASDAQ, uh, but yeah. you, you can come back to Asia. No, I, I think, no, I think having more venues, uh, I think it's fantastic for targets. Uh, I think it also, you know, they all kind of complement each other as targets. I think will gravitate to venues uh, where they are comfortable with, whether it's proximity from a geographic perspective, language, culture, the investor base. Uh, so I think it's going to be great. But also, I think ultimately in the long run, when the dust all settles, I think I believe the targets will weigh the following. Uh, one, where do you get the best valuations? Where do you have an ecosystem of vibrant, uh, comparable? How is market liquidity, but also the reputation of the venue? So I think it's all great. I think it's more choice for targets. 
I think we'll see also uh, you know great uh, sponsors uh, bringing targets to market. So very very positive in the long term. Good, nice to see the unanimous positive outlook among all panelists. Otherwise, I'd worry that we're all here. <laughs> Notwithstanding that, I think we've done very well on time. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Just three questions for the next six seven minutes, and then we will hit the time right. First one is actually directed at Paul. So the question is: Given the desire for high quality business combinations to create long term value. How, how proactive are you in maintaining a predefined watch list of DSPAC targets, which already meet the current XGS listing standards, or is it an ad hoc approach once an offer is announced? Yeah, it, it's it's really the the latter, right? Because you know, first of all, we we are uh, an open platform, a neutral platform, um, and we we like to believe in in market discipline and market forces, and that means we. We believe that companies will come to our platform when the time is is right for for them and you know a lot of this comes down also in the sponsor's ability to identify them so that's where the quality and the the, the track record of the sponsor comes into into place uh the second thing is the market develops fast right even if there's a company that doesn't meet the listing requirements today it may well meet the requirements uh next year or 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 maybe even sooner um and you know, I guess I just bring this back. We have a mechanism in place to uh, to to make sure that the the right quality of companies come to the platform, and that is the the listing requirements and the admission standards. Um, and so, if you go back to what I said earlier, we we don't want to see any daylight between a company who is looking to list through a DSPAC process or a conventional IPOs process. So it's exactly the same standards that should apply and will apply. Got it. Excellent. All right. This one's open to anyone that wants to put their hand up. Why do you need pipe if you do a good deal at a good valuation and the SPAC trades above cash in trust value? There will be no redemptions and has, hence no need for pipe. Any takers? Maybe, I mean, maybe I can have a go. Um, sure. from, uh, I think uh, in in Hong Kong, it's quite like, special, right? I think from a uh, investor protection standpoint, um, whilst you know we trust the sponsors and you know the target to negotiate a fair value, I think it will give the market a lot of confidence if you know there's pipe uh, pipe investors validating that process, and especially that is the critical point where you know what where the retail investors will be you know open up for you know for them to assess. You know the, the shares of the company so i think that is you know how we balance you know in public you know interest versus the interest of you know of the other participants christina yeah uh on top of uh, virginia's point i just want to mention that uh it's a it's a very normal that uh, in a dspec uh during a dspec process uh apparently there will be a uh, voting right uh, you know some some investors will decide to stay and other investors will choose to redeem and that's uh, just a very a natural process, and there will be some attrition in terms of uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the holdings of uh, the spec shares, right? Uh, once the redemption is uh, is done, so definitely the the you know first of all, there, there probably will be some uh, uh, some some room for the pipe investors to come in. On the other hand, uh, sometimes I, I guess uh, it, it happens very often that uh, the target uh, sort of size is uh, quite significant that the initial uh, you know, amount that put into the uh, the SPAC IPO will not be met, will not be sufficient uh, to finance the, the entire deal. So therefore, additional funding will be needed. Uh, that's where the uh, pipe investors will also be uh, very critical uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> achieving the completion of the deal. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I think there's some good questions coming in. So next one, what's the panelists views on overfunded SPAC structures? Will they come to Asia? I think I'll take this one. I've seen a lot of requests from uh, the investor side for this part, just given how the US market have been trading. So whilst I can safely say that the those SPACs in the US have been, at least the most recent ones, have been quite accustomed to a more of an overfunding structure um, and that varied in terms of the, the overfunding amount. Um, in Asia so far, we have not seen a similar level of um, overfunded uh, issuers and sponsors. 
Um, but you know, it remains to be seen um, depending on the volume that comes through and the quality of the sponsors that come through into this market. Um, and that will determine um, whether or not there's overfunding or changes in other uh, metrics of a spec, including warrant ratios, uh, redemption period, that sort of thing. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks for the response there, Selena. Very on point. Uh, maybe two more, because we do have a, another minute or two. I know we're running towards the end of time. How do you intend to deal with illiquidity in SPACs? Next question. Any takers from the panel? Um, maybe I just uh, talk a little bit because uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the SPAC um, sort of trading, right, uh, there are apparently, there are a few things that can be traded. One is the SPAC units and the second one is the SPAC shares and the third is the warrants. Uh, and, and, you know, at some point in the US, the, the, the warrants will be traded separately from, uh, from the units, therefore, you know, potentially you could be trading uh, any of these uh, three, right? Uh, and in Hong Kong, uh, on the day of uh, of IPO, stack IPO warrants will be separately traded as uh, uh, the stack shares. So the trading mechanism is a little bit different. But in any market, if you imagine why people trade, right? Uh, the reason is that apparently there is an expectation down the road in terms of uh, what kind of uh, target asset that could be folded into this uh, uh, spec st structure. But without that kind of uh, particular information, uh, it's hard to say that there is a lot of uh, you know, reason for a very active uh, SPAC trading. On the other hand, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the SPAC, uh, uh, you know, provides the mechanism that uh, if you don't like the, uh, the DSPAC target, you could always have the option to redeem. So therefore, you know, although you may not be able to get the liquidity, at the, you know, all the time, but you will be able to uh, sort of uh, choose uh, to exit at a, at a certain point, which also provides uh, additional flexibility to whoever you know, host those uh, uh, SPAC units or SPAC shares or warrants. And on the other hand, you know, the, the thing is that I think people want to invest in SPAC is uh, really to keep the options of uh, warrants because if uh, the share price really performs uh, in the way that they think <laughs> it would, right, the, the warrants access as well as so bringing uh, additional values. So I guess it's, uh, it's not really a 100% liquidity uh, sort of uh, consideration from the investor's uh, perspective. Right. Okay. I know we've got a few questions here. It's great to see such an active group of participants uh, who've been listening in. Obviously, lots and lots of questions, but maybe we'll just do one more in the interests of time. Uh, and this is, how do we pre prevent the situation, the SPAC not being able to find targets for DSPAC purposes, which is happening in the US right now? Hiring a consulting firm to, to I, do that. I, I, I guess, I guess you don't. don't. You don't. It's very difficult, right? Yeah. And I actually think there shouldn't be too much of a stigma on on a spec off in the end of the day, right? Uh, it's it it's part of the structure, and it actually gives a way out for both investors and the spec sponsor. Although it's obviously not great for the track record of the sponsor, but a D spec is always better than a bad. Uh, sorry, a spec off is always better than a bad D spec deal. Any other thoughts on this? All right. Well, look, that brings us to the end of this conversation. Thanks so much to the audience for asking very thoughtful and interesting questions. And sorry we couldn't address the last two. I just want to send a, a huge thank you to all the panel participants today for sharing very frank, open, down-to-earth insights about this industry and really getting to the heart of what it's all about and what the outlook looks like. And, you know, there's no better people to speak to within Asia Pacific than the five people we have here invited today. So really appreciate your insights, really appreciate your time. I know it's valuable and hopefully for everyone who joined today, uh, I hope you found this session useful and insightful and either it influencing what you're considering around doing your own SPAC, how you invest in SPACs, how you interface with the ecosystem, whatever it might be. For those of you who would like to read up a little bit more on this, just sending a link in the chat so you can download the report that was presented at the start of this presentation. Good bedtime reading, it will knock you right out. Um, if there's any other things that you would like to follow up on, please feel free to reach out to the Q&A team or the panelists here. Um, I'm sure, no doubt, that we'll all connect and cross paths sometime very soon. 
uh, and be looking at the future of this industry in a very rosy and interesting light. I'm very excited for what's ahead. Okay, thanks to everyone. Do take care and stay safe and wherever you are around the world, uh, look after yourselves and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.